agree, but you are available. Um, and I uh, would like to proceed to the next speaker, uh, Professor Leer, Saarland University, Hemholtz Institute. And uh, he will uh, speak about uh, transcutaneous vaccination. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thanks, Gerd, for the nice introduction. And thanks for the opportunity to be again at the Clinon. I think I've been at the very first and uh, keep following it. Uh, when I got the opportunity to present my data, I typically get two questions. First, where is the Saarland located? And second, what the heck is this Helmholtz? And uh, I made it a habit to show a little map of Germany where you can find the Saarland as one of the smallest states, if I can operate the laser pointer here, just touching where France and Germany get together. In fact, it's not too far away from Basel, the place today. Uh, it's a lovely place, not so mountainous like Geneva, but we have lots of forests and uh, can use that for mountain biking and so forth. The university is a former military barrack please fully con convert it to a place of science. Helmholtz, that's the second thing, is a research organization. We have four of them, uh, Max Planck, Fraunhofer, Leibniz, and Helmholtz. And Helmholtz is actually the biggest one supposed to take care of research subjects that are considered to be of national importance. You see it's relatively stringent, uh, organized. We are in this topic, health. And there, I'm belonging to a center that is focusing on infection research. And the Center for Infection Research, together with Saarland University, founded this institute, which is a smaller unit dedicated to pharmaceutical research, mostly in the context of infection research. So our mother institute is in Braunschweig, in the north of the country. Our institute is actually at the campus of Saarland University. So I'm holding these two functions, and that's why we have this double logo, which has the HDI and the Saarland University the logo integrated. Okay, uh, by the way, this is the new building that we are looking forward to move in during this summer. And uh, more importantly, what are we doing there? We focus on biological barriers, especially epithelial barriers, uh, areas that you can reach for other administration without using the needle, mainly what you can swallow, what you can inhale, what you can put on, uh, in, what you can put on the skin. We recently have some more focus on bacterial barriers, but today I will focus actually on the skin. And um, yeah, that we go over. The skin in, let's say, pharmacological or pharmaceutical contacts has different opportunities. You may sometimes want to go all the way through for systemic delivery. You know all these patches that deliver systemically active drugs. You may apply some ointments, treatments, topical formulations to deliver things to specific part of the skins. And sometimes you're just happy, happy if you don't see any penetration into the skin because you may want to protect the skin. For instance, titanium dioxide nanoparticles, there was a big concern 10 years ago. Now it's a little bit settled because people realize they actually don't go through this and they're effectively withheld, withheld by the stratum corneum. Well, you can make nanoparticles from biological materials, bio biocompatible materials. You can incorporate them into ointments and you can apply them to the skin. And what you observe then is actually, and that is a spin-off, an outcome of this safety-oriented research on technical nanomaterials, um, where we convert it into doing something good, actually, hopefully. And the, the remarkable observation was that nanoparticles fluorescently labeled, they penetrate relatively deep into the hair follicle compared to just the plain label. And this was done together with Jürgen Lademann at the charity hospital. Uh, you see it also in quantitative terms. You double or triple the amount. There is also a theory for that, uh, that it has to do with the scalded surface of the hair. Uh, and if you have the right size of particles, which must be in the nanometer size, you, you, have these, you are in these steps, and you are like a caterpillar transport movement by the hair drawn into the depths of the particles. You can also verify that there is a certain size dependency. Clearly, you can make particles too large if you go above one micron, but you can also make them too small. Less than 100 nanometer would be probably too small to take advantage of this phenomenon. Well, 
Um, that's good for safety reason. If you have potentially toxic materials, if you want to do something good pharmaceutical, you can think, well, actually, there's an opportunity that we have the dendritic cells here. So maybe we could use this for delivering actually antigens to those areas. And when you look at the field, what people are looking for to deliver antigens across the skin by non-invasive methods, there's a plethora of approaches. They are called minimally or non-invasive, but when you look at these micro needles, at large modifica modification, they still look pretty invasive. And uh, well, it would be most elegant if we would not have to change the skin at all. No chemical enhancers, no abrasion, no ultrasound, no magnetism, just the plain formulation. And that was actually what we thought we could try. Um, we made a proposal, because there's evidence that pollen may cause allergies by such a mechanism, to Bell and Melinda Gates, and we got some startup money, we got people involved, and then the students started to work. We started with particle technology like out of the shelves. Uh, this has already been presented, this type of technology by Gerrit Borchardt. You can use PLGA, you can PLGA in combination with Kaidosan, has the advantage that they are well approved in various pharmaceutical uh, preparations. They are biodegradable, biocompatible, so this is a good starting point. Um, you can encapsulate an antigen. In this case, we went for a protein. We went for a model protein, ovalbumin, just to see what we could reach there. Well, we characterized this in vitro, and then we do the, did the first experiment in animals, which is called the so-called adoptive transfer experiment. This is, let's say, the most sensitive best chances to see any effect in an animal because what you do is actually you give the mouse some uh, T helper cells that already know the antigen in case even traces would arrive. They would, you would get an, an, a reaction that they would start to proliferate. So we looked at the experiment and one important check was that we had of course to shave the animals, not more than that, but then also make sure that after a few days, the, after the shaving slightly evaluate the transepidermal water loss, this is a, a measure for the integrity of the skin barrier, came back to normal levels. And still after applying this to such normal levels again, um, we saw, well, when we just uh, apply uh, the, the chitosan, nanoparticles with some adjuvant, but no antigen, there was no reaction. If we gave the antigen intramuscularly, we had a full response, but we had, and that was encouraging, although not yet proving too much, also a full response when we put these nanoparticles containing the antigen, and also, that is important, some adjuvant, cyclodi-IMP, that was the contribution from my colleague um, Carlos Guzman in the immunology department who did all these animal experiments, we got an encouraging full response. Okay, now we said, okay, that, that encourages us enough to look at what is really there. So first thing we wanted to improve and to verify how many particles can we really get into the hair follicles. And because you cannot do that easily with human skin or pig skin, a good compromise is the pig ear. And Anna Raber, who did her -work, PhD work on the supervision of Steffi Hansen, who is in the room, she developed this model, quantified it, and actually, let's say there is bad news, there is good news. The good news is there's a very good correlation of the data on the pig ear with that what you see on human forearm. The bad news is you only get like 5%, maybe a little bit more, uh, into the hair follicle. That, that's simply the fact. And the question is if this will suffice. Um, you can improve, you can change the, the, the formulation. We looked at various factors. We looked even at more that we have published here. And you see, I would say, between 2 and 10%, you have a range, the surface properties of the particles. They do matter, but there is a limitation to that, that we have to face. Well, OK, now let's see what we can do in, in a scenario of more like a real in vivo vaccination experiment. So we tested on intact skin, no stripping, checking again, uh, the various, the formulation, uh, just without the antigen, over the antigen in solution, the antigen with nanoparticles but without this adjuvant, and we repeated the same thing actually also on taped stripped skin to take away this, this, this barrier. And our immunologist says one, one immunization that doesn't help at all, so you have to do three boosts and then let's look at the end, keep the fingers crossed and let's see what happens. We also made sure that we could see the nanoparticles going into the hair follicles. 
But then indeed we were happy that, like you can see it like the pipes of an organ, the control with nothing, then you get no response. And the strongest response you get actually, and that is let's say the message that I want to make, if you combine these nanoparticles with the antigen and the adjuvant, you really get a significant um, immune response in this terms as measured by IgG. And you can look at different subclasses. There are more details in the publication. There is also a cellular immune response, which you can measure by the release of several um, interleukins without going into details. The principle is, again, you need the combination of nanotechnology and proper adjuvantation, and then you get that. And indeed, through the intact skin, that is the important point. Um, yeah, patterns of, uh, I think this we skip. Still the question, can we actually make better particles for achieving this goal? Because originally these particles we had once developed for plasmid, deliver, plasmid DNA delivery, not really for antigen and protein delivery. So Ankit looked around in the literature and we found an interesting technology. These are inverse micellar sugar class nanoparticles, which, well, they're inverse sugar class particles. They are they're solid. At, at the state, you can better encapsulate proteinaceous structures. And what we also found actually they do better penetrate into the hair follicles, which is at least a good prerequisite to deliver more to the dendritic cells, which are located there. And what we found then here, we again, we did the study, we uh, refined the protocol a little bit more, uh, just tested, let's say, uh, on the intact skin in this case, but all the logical and plausible combinations over in solution, plant carriers, and so forth. We did two boosts, we renounced to do a third boost, but again, the result was confirming actually what we had seen before. Um, when you have the right combination, and again, I repeat it, you need the antigen, you need um, the nanotechnology to re-achieve the transport into the hair follicle, and you need an, ant an, an adjuvant to improve, to strengthen the immune response, you can do it. You can deliver antigens across the intact skin by means of hair follicles and talking to the dendritic cells without any invasive or skin destructive measure. Um, yeah, details what actually look for for different responses uh, show the same. And what I would like to say as a conclusion, nanoparticles provided they're made of safe, and I call safe, biocompatible and biodegradable materials allow to deliver small but significant amounts of antigens through the intact point of exclamation skin via the hair follicles. In order to elicit a sufficient humor and cellular immune response, adequate adjuvantation appears to be necessary. Just the nanoparticles is not good enough. And there is now uh, enough, actually, to what you can investigate and improve, and which, of course, we are doing. You can improve the material size, shape of the materials, the follicular penetration, where the best you can best release the antigen, taking it up the particle by the dendritic cells or not. There's more to do, which we, of course, are now in process of doing. I would like to thank the team, the people who were mainly responsible for the part in Saarbrücken, our two students, Ankit and Anna, and uh, Ste Steffi Hansen as a postdoc at that time in my department, provided great supervision and input, and the Braunschweig team with Carlos um, as the head of the department and the two postdocs, Thomas and Kai, uh, they did the animal experiments. This is the thank you to the rest of my team at Saarland University, wearing strange helmets and aprons to protect ourselves against the heat from the steelworks that we have been visiting. Um, this one I go over, but uh, if you like this kind of stuff, then you are also hardly invited for the, meanwhile, 11th edition of our biannual conference on biological barriers, which will take place next year in March, and that's perhaps another opportunity to discuss things and to see the Saarland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Klaus Michael. These helmets are not because of helmholtz. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting what you are telling us. Um, I would like to ask people two questions, four questions. Yes. Hello, um, Leanne Daly from King's College London. I was just curious if you know how the magnitude of your response compares to a classical vaccine administration. Yeah, 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 right. It's, it's really difficult to recognize people. I mean. <laughs> yes. Yeah, looking against it. Yeah, no, that's an obvious question. Actually, in that last study, in the if you look up the paper, we compared nasal administration and subcutaneous administration. The subcutaneous works best. 
the nasal did not, surprisingly, did not work at all. So um, follicular vaccination worked better for us uh, than mucosal vaccination. And of course, you have to, let's say, uh, you, you have to calc in take, into, take into account relatively large losses. You have to administer a lot of antigen that is, let's say, well, I would say that, that, that the, the benefit is that you have it in this non-invasive approach. This is like the non-invasive delivery of insulin by inhalation, or people think of doing it orally. You don't get the same bioavailability like in an invasive manner. If no more questions, uh, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, there's a size effect, you, sh you told yeah. us. And to my surprise, I was a little critical on your table, your particles are very small. There were 120 nanometers or something like that. Yeah. So why not making bigger ones then? Because that would be better. Yes. Next time. Next student. Oh, next time. Next time. Then next we invite you again. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> right. No, this is indeed you have, let's and, say. And, and, and if this would work out, eh, transfollicular, I, 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 anatomically I have a sort of problem because the particles go in, there's space there. And then, then they go deeper, but you're still in that space. There should be some biological barrier encountered by them. Uh, well, they, they stay there. This is topologically, in a sense, still outside. Yeah? The epithelium goes through mm -hmm. the statum corneum until a certain region where you, where, you, where, you, where you just have tight junctions that provide a last barrier. So these particles, they are, let's say, inside the half hair follicle, but you must imagine them between this epi the stratum corneum there and the follicle. So it's, it's in this uh, hole, so to speak, but not penetrated the skin yet. And then you are in this little sac and you cannot wash them away. By the way, this is not so surprising. When you, when you do your barbecue with, with, car with, with charcoal and something like that, you might observe that you get your half follicles, they get a little bit dark punctuated and you cannot wash this away so easily. That's maybe the same type of phenomenon. There's just an accumulation. And, and the point is that you perhaps can take advantage for this uh, purpose from this natural prolonged residence in the vicinity of cells that you want to talk to. Thanks so much.